So good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for coming back and joining us. I'm very glad that you weren't scared off by the idea that we are going to be um, sharing a lot ourselves today. So uh, this is going to be a different session to the, the um, kind that we've run so far. Um, this is all about your roof flexions. Um, I'm not going to even apologize for that pun. I think it's genius. Um, so what we're wanting to do today is, is to hear from you. We're, we're three out of four uh, weeks into our 30 days with Ruth, and, and it would be great to hear from you what you're thinking. How has the way that you've engaged with the text changed, or what have you learned, or what have you discovered, or what questions have you still got as you read? What stood out to you from some of what's been shared, and uh, what... Um, what are some of the, the things that you're conveying maybe in your own teaching and exploration of this as well. Uh, so that's what today is about. So we're gonna spend actually, uh, to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to say something, we're gonna spend the majority of our time today in breakout spaces and encouraging you to bring your thoughts. Uh, but to kick us off and just to try and um, bring together some of the uh, kind of ideas that are floating around so that we can take those into breakout spaces. I wonder if we could take a couple of minutes just to drop uh, each of us into the chat bar um, a single sentence question or a single sentence reflection uh, that has emerged for you in our study of Ruth so far. And I would encourage you to try and pick something that is has actually come out the last few weeks. So not something that you necessarily would have said before the start of June, if that makes sense. Um, so a single sentence question or a single sentence reflection, drop it into the chat and um, we'll just read some of those out just as a bit of a baseline for the conversations that we, we move on to have, if that's okay. So I'll give you a minute and then we'll read some of those out. Oh, we had our first reflection in from Rachel, uh, which is the, the conversation that emerged last week between Jill and I about Ruth being the face of God in a text, which, yeah, was a, a very interesting and provocative idea. Uh, things around welcoming the stranger, it's about racial equality, people commenting on how different translations of the text can affect how we see the characters, the recognition that Ruth gave up everything and expected nothing and God honored her for that posture. Got the conclusion that Ruth is a story about the universal concern of God. That's a lovely phrase, Alan. Thanks for that. From Joe, Ruth isn't as bad as perhaps we first thought. Maybe she's a strong woman. <laughs> that is two sentences, but we'll, we'll let that slide. The idea, uh, reflecting on the idea of us seeing the Trinity in the story again from, from last week's conversation with Jill. Um, again, one of Jill's points around um, God working outside the box in a rule-breaking way. Some people just appreciate the unknowns that have emerged from, from deeper study. Um, realize kind of what, what we're not told and what's not in the text and, and how we kind of infer things and, and fill in the blanks. A reflection from Lorraine around uh, us not knowing why the characters behaved as they did. So there are several different interpretations and in a way it's good to be free to interpret the characters ourselves. And I, I think that is the, the real strength of um, a narrative presentation of the text. Um, yeah, more reflections around interpretation. Uh, so our circumstances and our experiences seem to uh, influence our interpretation. And um, that actually realizing that is a really interesting, um, has a really interesting impact on how you approach the Bible more generally. Reflections around Ruth not being a pawn um, or as powerless as some people think. Point about everything in this book points to Christ. Something about kind of the loose ends around um, Ruth's story, kind of the, 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 the uncertainty of what took place in the field and did she convert and um, 10 years without children and then suddenly having a child. Something about the experience of the outsider, which is something Nigel is very passionate about and what we'll talk to us about next week. And one good question, which I think is a, is a great question and one of the reasons I suppose why this has been chosen for Bible Month is uh, why is Ruth hardly actually used in church today? Um, it's one of those narratives that was uh, rhythmically returned to by the people of Israel as, as part of their kind of um, their calendar of feasts. And yet in the church is, doesn't have much use or is not used much. And then some questions around the significance of names as well. So there are some good reflections to kick us off, some good thoughts. It may be that one of those has stood out to you and you've gone, oh, yes, actually, I want to make sure that we probe that in our group. Do take that initiative with you. 
I'm going to pop us into groups now for 35 minutes um, so that you have a chance to chat. Uh, Nigel, Jill and I will be in those groups trying to facilitate discussion, but please do um, look to drive those conversations yourselves as, as much as possible. Um, be open, be honest, be kind to one another if you disagree. Um, and uh, what we'll do is when we come back together in about 35 minutes, we'll try and have some nominees from each group just to feed back a little bit on the discussion that's taken place just so that we can benefit from hearing from the other groups. I hope your time is enjoyable. I hope your reflections are intriguing and I hope that you learn a lot and I will see you in 35 minutes. I'll just open those rooms now. So, I guess who wants to kickstart us with a thought? I'll start looking at the uh, questions you sent, uh, Michael. Mm. Which character do you most relate to and why? It made me realise I didn't relate to any of them directly. But the one who I got most interested in was the one we know least about, and that's Orpah. Uh, should I be worried that I'm not relating to any other character in a deep way? I don't think you have to be worried about it. No, I think it's okay for you to say actually the the, the experience of these characters doesn't um, correlate or resonate particularly strongly with my own life experience. I, th I think that's fine. Um, some people find that just a helpful way of, of, of opening up the text. As a knee-jerk reaction to that question about who did you relate to, mm. uh, I put Orpah because I thought if I'd had... Um, yes, the initial thing, yes, I'll come along with you, but had the chance for a get-out clause like Naomi gave her, I don't know that I would have been brave enough to leave everything I knew to have um, carried on. Oh. But uh, yeah, in, as, in as much as relating to anyone, that was really the only one I could say sure. I could relate to. The, the others was just, yeah the bravery of Ruth and the circumstances, yeah. Mm. I quite like Boaz. Um, the way that I see him is as an honourable man who has protected, who has provided. And I know that, that, as we've found over the last few weeks, that isn't necessarily everybody's interpretation, but it is mine. Yeah, I might go along with that. Um, I identify myself with Boas. He tried to do the, I see him as trying to do the right thing. And then he went beyond the, the, really the law. And that's always been me really. I think um, always tried to protect for, protect for family and keep money saved up in case the, the kids can't pay the mortgage and <laughs> find a car for them when the cards bust or whatever. You know. <laughs> Excellent, can I have your email? Yeah, I was just, saying, <laughs> just the dad, isn't it really? <laughs> I, I better put a, my vote in for Boaz. Um, I was trying to think of another reason, but I really, I really do like him. He he, um, he he does what women tell him, which is a lesson I've learned to my cost <laughs> through life. Um, and um, and I, I was struck when I read the uh, the play, and uh, we did on the first session, and and in reading the text, just how much he is there in the story, and. Um, despite, as I said, uh, knowing where authority lies, he also makes things happen and holds things together, which uh, uh, I really admire. I, I like the key character, I like Ruth, but <clears throat> I wonder how much she's, the text has been redacted back so that she's not just quite as wily as some of the bits of the text suggest that she is. I like Ruth too. Um, I think, as I said in my in my comments uh, in the chat room, that I think she's a very strong woman. She's not stupid. Um, and she, I think she knows what she wants. And despite what her mother-in-law uh, might have asked her to do, she, sort of goes her own way and she's the one I think as Jill mentioned last week she or it, it may have been in another Ruth thing that I've been to recently uh, she actually tells Boaz what to do 
uh, she breaks the rules and she tells Boaz what to do. And that's my kind of woman. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Joe. I, th I think Ruth is a strong woman. Um, and she's positive and optimistic and reactive. I mean, she does things. Naomi goes into despair because she's lost her husband and her sons and is, is ready to you know, just, just lose her daughters-in-law because she's very sad and she wants to change her name and be weepy. But Ruth is always positive about things and, and ready to do what needs to be done to make life better. Um, so I, I'd like her. I think I relate most to Ruth um, because Ruth and Naomi as well, you know, they're, they're destitute. Um, and they need help. They they need someone to help them. I've been in that position <clears throat> when I've been unable to help myself, and uh, and I found that God has come through for me. Well, John John picked a character that he said was one of the lesser characters that he related to. I thought he was far more far, far more a major character than the one that I associated with. Uh, I picked out the one that doesn't even have a name because I'm the one who'd want to sort of work out sort of the processes and what are the legal obligations and what does CPD say that we're supposed to be doing <laughs> in these particular circumstances. And that's me, sadly. That's very honest of you, Derek. <laughs> <laughs> so are you, are you the, the unnamed man who decides that he, he, he can't take Ruth because it would impact his family inheritance? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm quite up for the field. The field's fine, but... <laughs> I think that's, that is helpful though, isn't it? It's the honest reflection of, you know, often we are very drawn to um, the heroes or the major characters and we seek to map our lives onto them. And I think one of the challenges of the text is sometimes to go, am I the unnamed character who probably comes out of this not necessarily looking great? <laughs> you know, there, there's an honesty in that, which I think is really valuable. Well, I think particularly this week, I've seen so many things this week about the way in which the church is so good at um, reading Bible stories and taking the wrong character out of it. Mm. You know, the, the, the way in which we sort of, uh, the, 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 the powerful within the church uh, claim to be on the wrong side and sort of particularly in response to some of the race issues. You know, we're we seeing ourselves as being those escaping from Egypt without recognizing that we are often the oppressor. Yeah. So seeing it in that context and then relating it back to this conversation of who you are in this story, um, actually, you know, that's who I am closest to. And you know, that's a challenge I want to wake up to. Yeah. And actually important to be able to recognize that there is often a um, disconnect between who we know we're meant to want to be or who we're meant to aspire to be and who we actually are. And I, th I think actually that there's nothing wrong. It's in fact, it's a very important thing that we learn to recognize that there is often a discrepancy between those two things. What's wrong is if we recognize that and then we dig our trenches and are happy to remain where we are as opposed to go, oh goodness, am I actually Pharaoh in this story? In which case, what does it look like for me to divest myself of power rather than continue to try and want to recast Pharaoh as the underdog slave? I related to uh, Ruth because her story is similar to mine, apart from the fact that I wasn't sold to anybody. Uh, having come from another country to this country, I can understand um, apprehensions that she might have and so on and so forth going with, uh, with uh, Naomi back to Naomi's house. Mm -hmm. And, and um, how does your relating to Ruth impact the way that you approach the whole story? Do you mind sharing some of that, Cesar? Uh, well, I, I think the, the main point is welcoming the stranger, in, for me, in the story. Um, uh, uh, and that is an important thing. It, somehow it relates to what Derek was saying just now, that sometimes the church, we are very good at talking about things, but uh, not very good at implementing what we say, mm. uh, and so on. 
uh, but it's not easy. I'm not saying it is easy, or, or you know that, that there should be a, a straightforward answer to to these, these problems. Of course not. But uh, that's part of the process of being in a pilgrimage, I think, as a church and as an individual. And going down to similar to, to Caesar, really, we spent quite a lot of time working and um, living overseas. Um, and so I identify with Ruth more than um, anything else, really. Um, and it, it's difficult to understand if you've not been in, the, in, a, in a, another culture. Um, we were in a, a we're in India, where where women are not um, considered to be very, very high citizens in in lots of areas of society, and I've been in a situation where my wife's asked a question, and the answer has been addressed to me as if my wife didn't exist, um, and and so consequently, I can understand to a certain extent that sort of living in a foreign land that Ruth must have um, experienced, and it must have been very difficult for her to go um, to leave her own country. Um, especially when her sister-in-law went, went back to her own country. Uh, so she effectively was on her own and um, just embraced that sort of culture and, um, like Caesar said, integrated into it. Mm. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for a different character, if that's all right. And I'm, I don't know if it's the character I identify with. It's the one who I empathise most with, and that, that's Naomi. Um, I just kind of, uh, I just, I actually find it quite painful reading the story, mm. <laughs> uh, the 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 lot she was dealt, um, and you know, to almost have one of uh, the incidents <laughs> of her loss and her uh, struggle would have perhaps been uh, difficult to cope with. But to have had all of them, uh, I've kind of gone, wow, that's kind of a, a big ask. So that would that would just be my take. So. I like the relationship between Ruth and Naomi. So we don't know the um, the detail of the backstory, but they must have been quite close if she was considering leaving Moab to go um, to somewhere she didn't know. And I guess she had a lot of empathy for Naomi. And I think there must have been a strong relationship there prior to that. Thanks. Where do we see God at work in this story? Again, we've, we've mentioned a couple of times that we have characters reflect on what God has done, but God himself is only ever referred to indirectly by the characters. So where is Yahweh at work? What is Yahweh achieving through this story? Is Yahweh at work? What, what do people think? Start to finish. <laughs> Lots of different places. What sort of places then, Lorraine? Can you give some examples? Just maybe some people have said I see see God in too many places, but I don't agree with that. But just Elimelech having the idea that they'd better go to Moab because of the famine. Um, the the two boys married but didn't manage to produce any offspring. The fam family then. Well, Naomi realizing that the famine was over and she in Israel and she did actually say God had ended it. So then they went back. Ruth wouldn't be turned back. Um, Ruth taking the initiative and going gleaning was just happening to turn up at the right time. I mean, I could go on, so I think we'd let somebody else have a go. <laughs> I, I think it's uh, behind the story, really. Is, uh, is the purpose of the story, which is what uh, uh, is inspired by, by God. I, I, I cannot make a difference of what is God doing and not doing in the story itself. It's not a concept that I can relate to, but I, okay. I would relate to the idea of uh, the story being inspired, very bravely executed, rather written, uh, you know, by, by God uh, and written by, by a human being that uh, felt strongly a call to, to pursue justice. Also, the, the, um, where, where, where Boaz, I think Boaz talks about, or somebody talks about uh, Ruth being 
covered under the wings that may God cover you with his wings mm. and then when she meets Boaz she's asked to be she asks him to cover her um, in that proposal to me there's that sense of them the two of them being covered Na Ruth and Naomi being covered throughout the whole story um, and, and being protected as they go through but they need they need to respond to the opportunities that are presented to them they, they need to work with the opportunities that come their way rather than sit back and um, and, and just allow uh, allow circumstances to take over they they participated in their own salvation yeah we have to recognize um, the, the suffering that Naomi went through, really, losing her husband and then losing the two boys. And uh, at the end of chapter one, she said, why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So the fact that she can have some hope uh, is incredible, really. <laughs> now, Ruth, I mean, Naomi, she thought that her God had left her, but God was always with her. And only she thought that when she, um, her two um, daughter-in-laws were going back, she ended saying a prayer to them. That means she still believed in God, no matter what you know she was thinking. And I think God was with her all the time. He never left her. And only they left from one place to the other because of um, famine. God got went with, was with her. He went with, there with them as well and kept them safe. All they had mm. lost, you know. A husband and children. I think it was for a reason though why they died anyway because look what happened to her at the end you know to Ruth which is good. Uh, along with others I see God at work everywhere in the story. I think God's at work right from right from the beginning um, when they decide to go back and it's, it's that journey back that, that takes them back to it under God's wing. Um, so so the, there's the heading back and there's the finding redemption. You know, so for me, um, Boaz is, he, he's cast in the story as a redeemer, but, um, but he's also a picture of Christ. And, and I think at the time that it's set, it's a picture of God. And it's in, in a way, it's a picture of the relationship between God and Israel. So, so in other words, mm -hmm. I think you know, there, there's a sense in which Ruth is a picture of Israel and the relationship with, with God, because God is cast as the redeemer. Um, but, you know, I've been in a position where I needed a redeemer, so I, I, I'm, I'm identifying with Ruth. Um, and love the ability to see God at work in through through the whole story I, I suppose what I find interesting about that question is um, there's there's two sides to it where do we as um, outside interpreters of the events see God but where do those who are the inside interpreters of the events see God so we, we finished our conversation just now in our breakout space talk about the fact that um, Naomi says it's Yahweh who has made her life bitter so her, as an insider, interpreting the events, probably interprets them very differently to us as outsiders. And then the question is, is Naomi wrong? Are we right? Is, is actually there truth to her claim? And um, there's multiple ways, I think, of answering that question. But I think it's, it's, that's one of the things that makes engaging with the story so interesting, is because um, we may choose to disagree with how the characters themselves theologize the events. And um, I think the fact that God himself is not given precise agency, invites us to contend with their theologizing the events. Um, well, I see it as a kind of parable. Um, you know, when Jesus told parables, um, he left us to see where God was in the story. And the fact that God is not made explicit very often um, makes the story seem like a parable because God's presence is behind it. It's, it's about providence, about God guiding these people and especially Ruth.
Something else that came out for us when we were talking this morning is it's set in the time of judges and mm. Ruth's a Moabite. Um, and the Moabites during, um, during the period of judges were um, like the biggest enemy. It was the Moabites that yeah. were enslaving Israel and um, the redeemers had to be found, the judges had to be found to, to free Israel from the Moabites. So, so not only is she um, a refugee and destitute, but she's also the enemy. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, along with that, Boaz is the offspring of Rahab, the prostitute, mm -hmm. who's a foreigner. So, so there's that, um, you know, he, his lineage is not pure, if you like, pure Israelite. Mm. Maybe, maybe it's a... Um, Maybe it's also a story of, you know, the other redeemer, like the um, the other brother is a picture of um, Israel, Israelite-ness, if you like, you know. Yeah. Um, and and um, the other side of what it, what the law should represent, which is mercy. Mm. Well, but as a parable, for me, it's a story about said it's mm. a story about loving kindness uh, expressed by God to each of these characters and by the characters to to themselves um, yes, it sounds to me as though it from what um, Ian is saying that the, the story is saying that God has no no favorites that whoever does the will of the Lord um, will be acceptable to God so um, it sort of says to us some people feel as though they're they're a Christian just because they were born into a Christian family whereas you know we believe that there has to be a, a, a conscious commitment to to Christ that we're not Christians just because we're born into Christian families and you're not you're not a Jew just because you are born into Judaism. It's about having a real relationship with God. The Hesed thing's a really interesting one, isn't it? The, the, that idea that Ruth is attributed as loving and showing love and kindness in the way that God shows love and kindness. And isn't it interesting that someone who seems to succeed in carrying the heart of God becomes the grandmother of the king who is labeled as the one after God's own heart. There's, I wonder whether there's a, there's a deliberate link in there that I'd not seen before until you just shared that. So that, that kind of just a springboard thought. Um, this was a, a conversation I had a bit offline with, with, with Derek earlier today around the, the leaving country, leaving people, leaving family, but the question mark over whether or not Ruth left faith. Was Ruth a convert to um, Judaism or was she not? Now, I, my argument would be that I, I think the text is quite clear on this, but Derek um, is, is, uh, has pushed back on that, uh, which is, is more than fair, and has pushed back on that, suggesting actually um, certain Jewish commentaries are adamant that she did not convert, um, which I find interesting and enlightening because I, I always want to hear how the Jewish people interpret their own stories and heritage because actually it's, it's helpful to learn from that rather than to tell them that they're wrong about their own cultural artifacts. Um, it's just simply un, untrue and unfair. Um, so I wonder if anyone has any reflections on that. Or Derek, did you want to chime in uh, and kind of set out some of your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the thing that I sent through was, was essentially the challenge as to whether we think that um, Ruth formally converted. Um, at one level, it stands in sharp contrast to the other stories because if we treat her as being permanently the outsider, then this story speaks to us in one way about the outsider. That's quite a lot diluted if we try and classify it as somebody that has converted and become Jewish. 
Um, and certainly in terms of her fitting within the story and David being properly Jewish and so on, from some of the rabbinic readings, you'd have to insist that she, she has to have been Jewish because she couldn't have married into the family unless she had already done that conversion. So at one level, the Jewish narrative would demand that she converted, but that dilutes it. So, so, so that's probably less clear than what I put in the email, but there is that tension. Um, there is that tension between understanding her as a convert, which dilutes the outsider. Mm -hmm. But if we impose that conversion, um, then, then if we throw away that conversion, then we are rejecting what actually is, is quite a, a, an important fi feature of rabbinic Judaism, if not necessarily the Judaism of the time in which it was written. Mm. Yeah, so if she's fully enculturated, does she cease to be an outsider, and therefore does all of the application of the text in terms of welcoming the outsider become massively watered down? Because actually it's a, we will only welcome you if you will adopt <laughs> all of our ways and customs. Um, I, I, I think that uh, she did uh, leave her God and uh, as she left her family. And that um, uh, adds more weight to this, the whole argument, I think. Because curiously, uh, the family name will be maintained through her, which is a very Jewish uh, thing to do, isn't it? There is no inheriting the land unless you marry uh, Ruth. This is a, the point of, of you know, her being sold, as it were. It's not, the word sold is not exactly I think an excellent translation for it is as if um, if I say uh, to my to one of my grandchildren, you know, I'll just come, uh, let's uh, I'll take you to the cinema uh, tomorrow. What would you like to say to see? And then uh, his father says to me, Ah, oh, yes, but if you take Peter, you have to take Joe as well. And that's just that's the idea. Of, if you take the, the land, you have to take Ruth as well because otherwise. Uh, the, the family link will be uh, lost. So it is important to me that the book says, the story says clearly to me anyway, that uh, Ruth has abandoned uh, her God. Do people want to just take the conversation forward, either on the back of what someone said or off in a different direction, or we can ponder the other question Michael sent out about, you know, where is God in, in all of this, in the story? Um, I'm going to just step back, really. Um, I, I just wonder whether it makes a difference what we, what we think the genre of the text is. If we view it as history or if we view it as an allegory, because for me it's an allegory, and therefore the man with no name mm. is to ramp up the tension. Mm. And so it doesn't really matter that it doesn't quite fit into the leveret kind of rules and regulate. It's, it's there as a literary device. Mm -hmm. And we run the risk. There are always plot holes. <laughs> you know, yeah. you watch any film that you want and there's a plot hole. And you kind of have to suspend your disbelief at that point and just park it. Mm -hmm. But that's because I view the text as, as allegory. Mm. I don't view it as history. Okay. So and it was where written, does the family tree come in then? Personally, I think the family tree was added later. Right. I don't okay. think that was the object of the exercise of writing the story. I think it was added in later to make the story do something slightly different for a slightly different audience, which is perfectly legitimate. You get it all over the Bible. Um, so why do you think the story was written in the first place? I think it's something about... I think... For me, the evidence seems to point towards it being written at the time when the exiles come back, Nehemiah, Ezra, the rules about not marrying foreign wives, mm. and it's, it stands alongside the book of Jonah, which is very, very similar in form as a statement of actually this God is a universal God. This yeah. is not a God who is bounded by a tribe and a people. But this God is a God of universal love and grace. Yeah. Cool. But that's just for me, you know, yeah. that's what makes sense for me. And no, no, when it said, when it, uh, that we were asked, what do we see? Well, it was the next question. Why, why is it a story? I mean, mine 
my response was that it was to show that God loves, cares for, can use anybody, whatever race, wherever they come from, whatever they do. So it that echoes what you're saying, really, doesn't it? Thank you, Susan. Morag, were you going to say something? I was going to say more or less the same, that it was written in the time of the exiles when Ezra had said about divorce your foreign wives. Um, and it was it counter to that. Also, taking up the allegory uh, point, it would explain why the names are such, because Chilean and Marlon, meaning sick and ailing, I mean, what parent would call them kids yeah. that? <laughs> I know Hosea does that, but it's... Um, it would explain the significance of the names to what the story was saying. And Boaz meaning redeemer. A bit too neat. Mm. Yeah, all of that stuff's too neat for me. I don't like neat. Yeah. <laughs> My wife and I are going through the assessment process to be foster parents. Uh, and we did a fascinating uh, exercise last Saturday morning uh, about names and about how important they are mm. in many, many cultures because they are more than a name. You know, they tell a story, they keep a heritage. Uh, and I, I, I can't understand why, you know, you call them those names up in the story of Ruth, but it is, I just find names fascinating. Uh, whereas we tend to increasingly go, uh, Oh, uh, we'll name them off after after the latest celebrity sensation or something. Uh, um, I saw a lady the other day. I don't know if you saw it. Uh, um, her young baby, uh, she'd survived COVID nineteen, uh, and so she called her baby Tyson <laughs> because it was a fighter. Mm. <laughs> and I go, really? That's kind of is that baby going to like that in years to come? I don't know. I worked in Nigeria for a time, <coughs> and. Uh, some of the local guys, lovely people who were there to welcome me and so on, their names were based on the day they were born. So one was Friday and one was Tuesday. And that mm. seemed a bit odd to us, but that would seem very acceptable, really. Mm. This is Friday. You would he'd be with you for yeah. a week. <laughs> the two nannies, the two nannies in the nursery where my daughter went were called Comfort and Joy. And I, mm. I, I, said, to the, I said to the owner of the... I said, when are you going to get glad tidings then? <laughs> I just see that the, the writer of the story, I see it as a novel really, or a story to get a point home with meaning to it and to give some essence to the story and some piquancy and uh, give special names and meanings to the characters. So as you read the story, the names of the people give you some clue to their background and what, what their place is in the story. It's seen, uh, like a literary device, really. Just something about names and identity and the importance of names. And if, if we're named, we're recognised and valued. And something that's just, well, it's not new, but in the news, when they had the five o'clock declarations of how many had died, it's just a number, a statistic. Uh, and it's impersonal and it sort of washes over after a while. And one has to keep remembering each of those is a name, each of those is valuable. But without the names, it's easy to uh, not to pay attention. Mm. I was the significance of names. I was reflecting with Mel. Go on, Paul. Sorry, go on. Just to say, the BBC do show photographs and names, uh, sort of after on the six o'clock news, which gives yeah. some meaning to who's died. It's not they don't give. 45,000, but they do show quite a lot of people, their photographs, mm. and I thought that was quite a sensible, quite a touching thing to do. Yeah, yeah I, I, I was reflecting with my wife over this lunchtime about um, how the, the three people killed in Reading um, mm. uh, is, is uh, tragic, all deaths tragic, but, but, but they were able, the media is able to personalise that and give names to it, so it has much more something than than the thousands of people whose names we don't know because of the virus and i was really mm. struck around that whole uh, thing how we, we that that is what happens really i think um the nazis uh understood that it depersonalized mm. you without names so you were tattooed with a number and mm. referred to by your number to take away your humanity and identity um so it's, it's a very important part of you. 
I was, I, has anyone seen the film Harriet? Uh, it's about uh, a slave uh, Not yet. Uh, called Minty, uh, who uh, basically escapes in America on what became known as the... Uh, oh, is that Harriet Tubman? Yes, I've yes. Read, I've read her life story, but I haven't yes. seen that film. You... Uh, I don't want to spoil it if you are going to watch it, but there's, uh, when the slave uh, escapes, it goes to a safe town, which is in the north of America, uh, where uh, slavery uh, slaves were free. Um, and uh, there's a guy who uh, logs everyone's story uh, who has escaped. Um, and at the end of his logging, he basically says, what do you now want to be called? Mm. Uh, but all the slaves rename themselves um, and I th again I thought this was really relevant as I was watching it just the other week to the Ruth story about how mm. um, the change in circumstance or the change in location uh, enables a renaming in a way we perhaps struggle with in our or I struggle with in our culture we never hardly ever do that do we it's kind of really interesting so, mm. so would we consider in that Ruth type tradition or even biblical tradition because I think God does it quite a bit of renaming ourselves perhaps with anything and if so perhaps a personal reflection rather than public declaration what might you call yourself um. but before we started studying Ruth I'd always just thought the best of everybody and but Naomi really cared about her daughter-in-law and Ruth really loved Naomi and Boaz was such a really nice man. And then you hear other people saying, oh, well, Naomi, Naomi was very scheming, wasn't she? And, and <laughs> Ruth only went back there because she didn't like her mum back home and she thought she'd do better than <laughs> Naomi and all this sort of stuff. I was quite, you know, my bubble was burst. <laughs> <laughs> It's quite good though, I think, to burst that bubble every now and yeah. again. Because then you kind of, you revisit it, don't you? And you re oh, yeah. and yeah. keep stuff that you've always believed, but it's kind of threaded with things that you've learned or, or reconsidered, so. But we, we have been introduced through, through Michael and, and, and other leaders that uh, we could look at the stories through different sorts of eyes, different sorts of focal points. and. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, although I find that at the, the end of this process, I'm not really changing my mind about what I thought years ago, but mm. I felt it has been a great enrichment to think about how other people might read it. And I, I think, of course, that's, that's part of Bible story in its essence, is, is actually learning from one another like this. And I think uh, in terms of using this as a, um, if you like, an, an education in how to do Bible study, I think it's really good. So uh, thank you for engaging with that. I, I do hope that actually you found that interesting and insightful hearing other people's perspectives is certainly even just in, in what's been shared back there. There's been um, things that I, I wouldn't have thought of or would have disagreed with or would have pushed back on. And that, but actually hearing it and hearing the stories associated with it and the reasons behind it um, reminds me again, this is why we read the text together. Uh, this is this is why different people's experiences always form some of their engagement, and this is also why actually um, there is power in in study alongside people who would have different perspectives because it it opens us up to avenues of thought and inquiry that we we wouldn't necessarily go down ourselves without them there. So thank you for everything that you contributed. Uh, next week we have our last webinar. Ah, oh, I hear you all saying down your microphones that are muted. Um, it's sad times, but um, we're looking forward to hearing from Nigel, who's going to talk a bit about the theme of migration in the story. Nigel, do you want to give us a quick trailer of what you're going to say, or do you want it to all be a surprise? I think it needs to be a surprise. Okay, we'll leave it as a surprise then. But if you want to hear some of <laughs> Nigel's reflections around the theme of migration uh, in the story of Ruth, that would be great. We'll be back at the same time at 2.45. And... Um, until then, have a good week, enjoy the heat wave, and uh, be blessed and enjoy your continued journey with Ruth through the month of June. Thanks very much, and we'll, we'll see you again soon. Take care.